Part 1, Chapter 4 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 1, Chapter 4. After the ladies had gone to bed on the night of Lady Kitty's recitation, William Ash stayed up till past midnight talking with old Lord Grosville. When relieved of the presence of his womenkind, who were apt either to oppress him in the person of his wife, or to puzzle him in the persons of his daughters, Lord Grosfield was not by any means without value as a talker. He possessed that narrow but still most serviceable fund of human experience which the English landowner, while our English tradition subsists, can hardly escape if he will. As guardsman, volunteer, magistrate, lord lieutenant, member, for the sake of his name and his acres, of various important commissions, as military attaché, even for a short space, to an important embassy, he had acquired by mere living that for which his intellectual betters had often envied him, a certain shrewdness, a certain instinct, as to both men and affairs, which were often of more surface to him than finer brains to other persons. But, like most accomplishments, these also brought their own conceit with them. Lord Grosville, having, in his own opinion, done extremely well without much book education himself, had but little appreciation for it in others. Nevertheless, he rarely missed a chance of conversation with William Ash, not because the younger man, in spite of his past indolence, was generally held to be both able and accomplished, but because the elder found in him an invincible taste for men and women, their fortunes, oddities, catastrophes, especially the latter, similar to his own. Like Mary Lister, both were good gossips, but of a much more disinterested type than she. Women, indeed, as gossips, are too apt to pursue either the damnation of someone else or the apotheosis of themselves. But here the stupider, no less than the abler man, showed a certain broad detachment not very common in women. Amused by the human comedy itself, making no profit out of it, either for themselves or morals, but asking only that the play should go on. The incident, or rather the heroine of the evening, had given Lord Grosfield a topic which, in the case of William Ash, he saw no reason for avoiding. And, in the peace of the smoking-room, when he was no longer either hungry for his dinner or worried by his responsibilities as host, he fell upon his wife's family, and, as though he had been the manager of a puppet show, unpacked the whole box of them for Ash's entertainment. Figure after figure emerged, one more besmirched than another, till finally the most beflecked of all was shaken out and displayed. Lady Grosville's brother, and Kitty's father, the late Lord Blackwater. And on this occasion Ash did not try to escape the story, which was thus a second time brought before him. Lord Grosville, if he pleased, had a right to tell it, and there was now a curious feeling in Ash's mind which had been entirely absent before that he had, in some sort, a right to hear it. Briefly, the outlines of it fell into something like this shape. Henry, 5th Earl of Blackwater, had begun life as an Irish peer, with more money than the majority of his class, an initial advantage soon undone by an insane and unscrupulous extravagance. He was, however, a fine, handsome, voracious gentleman, born to prey upon his kind, and when he looked for an heiress, he was not long in finding her. His first wife, a very rich woman, bore him one daughter. Before the daughter was three years old, Lord Blackwater had developed a sturdy hatred of the mother, chiefly because she failed to present him with a son, and he could not even appease himself by the free spending of her money, which, so far as the capital was concerned, was sharply looked after by a pair of trustees, Belfast manufacturers and Presbyterians, to whom the Blackwater type was not at all congenial. These restrictions presently wore out Lord Blackwater's patience. He left his wife, with a small alliance, to bring up her daughter in one of his Irish houses, while he generously spent the rest of her large income, and his own, and a great deal besides, in London and on the continent. Lady Blackwater, however, was not long before she obliged him by dying, her girl, then twelve years old, lived for a time with one of her mother's trustees. But when she had reached the age of seventeen, her father suddenly commanded her presence in Paris, that she might make acquaintance with his second wife. 
The new Lady Blackwater was an extremely beautiful woman, Irish, as the first had been, but like her in no other respect. Margaret Fitzgerald was the daughter of a cosmopolitan pair who, after many shifts for a living, had settled in Paris, where the father acted as correspondent for various English papers. Her beauty, her caprices and her affairs were all well known in Paris. As to what the relations between her and Lord Blackwater might have been before the death of the wife, Lord Grosville took a frankly uncharitable view. But when the event occurred, Blackwater was beginning to get old, and Miss Fitzgerald to become necessary to him. She pressed all her advantages, and it ended in his marrying her. The new Lady Blackwater presented him with one child, a daughter, and about two years after its birth, he sent for his elder daughter, Lady Alice, to join them in the sumptuous apartment in the Place Vendôme, which he had furnished for his new wife, in defiance both of his English and Irish creditors. Lady Alice arrived, a fair slip of a girl, possessed, it was plain to see, by a nervous terror both of her father and stepmother. But Lady Blackwater received her with effusion, caressed her in public, dressed her to perfection, and made all possible use of the girl's presence in the house for the advancement of her own social position. Within a year, the Belfast trustees, watching uneasily from a distance, received a letter from Lord Blackwater announcing Lady Alice's runaway marriage with a certain Colonel Wensleydale, formerly of the Grenadier Guards. Lord Blackwater professed himself vastly annoyed and displeased. The young people, furiously in love, had managed the affair, however, with a skill that baffled all vigilance. Married they were, and without any settlements. Colonel Sensodea having nothing to settle, and Lady Alice, like a little fool, being only anxious to pour all that she possessed into the lap of her beloved. The father threw himself on the mercy of the trustees, reminding them that in little more than three years Lady Alice would become unfettered mistress of her own fortune, and begging them meanwhile to make proper provision for the rash but happy pair. Harry Wensleydale, after all, was a rattling good fellow, with whom all the young women were in love. The thing, though naughty, was natural, and the Colonel would make an excellent husband. One Presbyterian trustee left his business in Belfast and ventured himself among the abominations of Paris. He was much befooled and befeasted. He found a shy young woman tremulously in love, a handsome husband, an amiable stepmother. He knew no one in Paris who could enlighten him, and was not clever enough to invent means of getting information for himself. He was induced to promise a sufficient income for the moment on behalf of himself and his co-trustee, and for the rest was obliged to be content with vague assurances from Colonel Wensleydale that as soon as his wife came into her property, fitting settlements should be made. Four years passed by. The young people lived with the Blackwaters, and their income kept the establishment going. Lady Alice had a child, and was at first not altogether unhappy. She was little more than a timid child herself, and no doubt, to begin with, she was in love. Then came her majority. In defiance of all her trustees, she gave her whole fortune to her husband, and no power could prevent her from so doing. The Blackwater menage blazed up into a sudden splendour. Lady Blackwater's carriage and Lady Blackwater's jewels had never been finer, and amid the crowds who frequented the house, the slight figure, the sallow face and absent eyes of her stepdaughter attracted little remark. Lady Alice Wensleydale was said to be delicate and reserved. She made no friends, explained herself to no one, and it was supposed that she occupied herself with her little boy. Then, one December, she disappeared from the apartment in the Place Vendôme. It was said that she and the boy found the climate of Paris too cold in winter and had gone for a time for, to Italy. Colonel Wensleydale continued to live with the Blackwaters, and their apartment was no less sumptuous, their dinners no less talked of, their extravagance no less noisy than before. But Lady Alice did not come back with the spring, and some ugly rumours began to creep about. They were checked, however, by the death of Lord Blackwater, which occurred within a year of his daughter's departure, by the monstrous debts he left behind him, and by the sale of the contents of the famous apartment, 
matters, all of them sufficiently ugly or scandalous in themselves, to keep the tongues of fame busy. Lady Blackwater left Paris, and when she reappeared, it was in Rome as the Comtesse d'Estre, the wife of yet another old man, whose health obliged them to winter in the south and to spend the summer in yachting. Her salon in Rome under Pio Nonno became a great rendezvous for English and Americans, attracted by the historic names and titles that Monsieur d'Estre's connections among the black nobility, his wealth, and his interest in several of the Catholic banking houses of Roman Naples, enabled his wife to command. Colonel Wensendale did not appear. Madame d'Estre's let it be understood that her stepdaughter was of a difficult temper, and now spent most of her time in Ireland. Her own daughter, her darling Kitty, was being educated in Paris by the Sœur Blanche, and she pined for the day when the little sweet should join her, ready to spread her wings in the great world. But mothers must not be impatient. Kitty must have all the advantages that befitted her rank, and to what better hands could the most anxious mother entrust her than to those charming, aristocratic, accomplished nuns of the Sœur Blanche? Then, one January day, Monsieur Destre drove out to San Paolo Fuori Lamora and caught a glass from the snowy Sabines coming back. In three days he was dead, and his well-provided widow had snatched the bulk of his fortune from the hands of his needy and embittered kindred. Within six months of his death she had bought a house in St James's Place, and her London career had begun. It is here that we come in said Lord Cresville, when, with more digressions and more plainness of speech with regard to his condemned sister-in-law that can be here reproduced, he brought his story to this point. Blackwater, the old ruffian, when he was dying, had a moment of remorse. He went to my wife and asked her to look after his girls. For God's sake, Lena, see if you can help Alice. Wednesdale's a perfect brute. That was the first light we had on the situation, for Adelina had long before washed her hands of him and we knew that he, she hated us. Well, we tried, of course we tried, but so long as her husband lived, Alice would have nothing to say to any of us. I suppose she thought that for her boy's sake she'd better keep a bad business to herself as much as possible. Winsledale, Winsledale, said Ash, who had been smoking hard and silently beside his host. You mean the man who distinguished himself in the Crimea? He died last year at Naples, wasn't it? Lord Graceville assented. It appeared that during the last year of his life, Lady Alice had nursed her husband faithfully through disease and poverty, for scarcely a vestige of her fortune remained, and an application for money made by Wednesdale to Madame Destre, unknown to his wife, had been peremptorily refused. The Colonel died, and within three months of his death, Lady Alice had also lost her son and only child, a blood poisoning developed in Naples, whither he had been summoned from school that his father might see him for the last time. Then, after seventeen years, Lady Alice came back to her kindred, who had last seen her as a young girl, gentle, undeveloped, easily led, and rather stupid. She returned a grey-haired woman of thirty-four, who had lost youth, fortune, child, and husband, whose aspect, moreover, suggested losses still deeper and more drear. At first she wrapped herself in what seemed to some a dull and to others a tragic silence. But suddenly a flame leaped up in her. She became aware of the position of Madame d'Estre in London, and one day, at a private view of the Academy, her former stepmother went up to her smiling with outstretched hand. Lady Alice turned very pale. The hand dropped and Alice Wensidale walked rapidly away. But that night at the Graceful House she spoke out. She told Lena and myself the whole story. You'd have thought the woman was possessed. My wife, she's not of the crying sort, nor am I, but she cried, and I believe, well, I can tell you it was enough to move a stone. And when she'd done, she just went away and locked her door and let no one say a word to her. She's told one or two other relations and friends, and... And the relations and friends have told others? Well, I can answer for myself, said Graceville, after a pause. This happened three months ago. I never have told and never shall tell all the details as she told them to us. But we have let enough be known. Enough? 
enough to damn Madame d'Estrée? Well, well, as far as the women were concerned, she was mostly that already. There are other tales going about. I expect you know them. No, I don't know them, said Ash. Lord Grosville's face expressed surprise. Well, this finished it, he said. Poor child, said Ash slowly, putting down his cigarette and turning a thoughtful look on the carpet. Alice, said Lord Grosville. No. Oh, you mean Kitty? Yes, I've forgotten her for the moment. Yes, poor child. There was silence a moment. Then Lord Grosville inquired, What do you think of her? I, said Ash with a laugh. I don't know. She's obviously very pretty. And a handful, said Lord Grosville. Oh, quite plainly a handful, said Ash, rather absently. Then the memory of Kitty's entry recurred to them both, and they laughed. Not much shyness left in that young woman, eh? said the old man. She tells my girl such stories of her French doings. My wife's had to stop it. She seems to have had all sorts of love affairs already. Of course you have any number over here, sure to. Some unscrupulous fellow will get hold of her, for naturally the right sort won't marry her. I don't know what we can do. Adeline offered to take her altogether, but that woman wouldn't hear of it. She wrote Nina rather a good letter on her dignity and that kind of thing. We gave her an opening, and by Jove, she took it. And meanwhile, Lady Kitty has no dealings with her stepsister? You heard what she said? Extraordinary girls let the thing out plump like that, just like the blood. They say anything that comes into their heads. If we had known that Alice was to be with the Sarbis this weekend, my wife would certainly have put Kitty off. It would be uncommonly awkward if they were to meet. Here, for instance. Hello, is it getting late? For the whist players at the end of the library had pushed back their chairs and men were strolling back from the billiard room. I'm afraid Lady Kitty understands there is something wrong with her mother's position, said Ash as they rose. I dare say, brought up in Paris, you see said the white-haired Englishman with a shrug. Of course, she knows everything she shouldn't. Brought up in a convent, please, said Ash, smiling, and I thought the French girl was the most innocent and ignorant thing alive. Lord Grosville received the remark with derision. You ask my wife what she thinks about French convents. She knows she's had lots of Catholic relations. She'll tell you tales. Ash thought, however, that he could trust himself to see that she did nothing of the sort. The smoking room broke up late, but the new undersecretary sat up still later, reading and smoking in his bedroom. A box of foreign office papers lay on his table. He went through them with a keen sense of pleasure, enjoying his new work and his own confidence to do it, of which, notwithstanding his remarks to Mary Lister, he was not really at all in doubt. Then, when his comments were done and the papers replaced in the order in which they would now go up to the Secretary of State, he felt the spring night oppressively mild, and, walking to the window, he threw it wide open. He looked out upon a Dutch garden full of spring flowers in blue. In the midst was a small fountain which murmured to itself through the night. An orangery or conservatory of a charming 18th century design ran round the garden in a semicircle, its flat pilasters and mouldings of yellow stone, taking under the moonlight the colour and the delicacy of ivory. Beyond the terrace which bordered the garden, the ground fell to a river, of which the reaches, now dazzling, now sombre, now slipping secret under woods, and now silverly open to the gentle slopes of the park, brought wildness and romance into a scene that had else been tame. Beyond the river, on a rising ground, was a village church with a spire. The formal garden, the Georgian conservatory, the park, the river, the church. They breathed England and the traditional English life. All that they implied of custom and inheritance, of strength and narrowness, of cramping prejudice and stubborn force, was very familiar to Ash, and on the whole very congenial. He was glad to be an Englishman, and a member of an English government. The ironic mood which was tolerably constant in him did not in the least interfere with his normal enjoyment of normal goods. He saw himself often as a shade among shadows, as an actor among actors, but the play was good all the same. 
That a man should know himself to be a fool was, in his eyes, as it was in Lord Melbourne's, the first of necessities. But, fool or no fool, let him find the occupations that suited him and pursue them. On those terms, life was still amply worth living, and Ginger was still hot in the mouth. This was his usual philosophy. Religiously, he was a sceptic, enormously interested in religion. Should he ever become Prime Minister, as Lady Tramwell prophesied, he would know much more theology than the bishops he might be called on to appoint. Politically, at the same time, he was an aristocrat, enormously interested in liberty. The absurdities of his own class were still more plain to him, perhaps, than the absurdities of the populace. But had he lived a couple of generations earlier, he would have gone with passion for Catholic emancipation and boggled at the Reform Bill. And if fate had thrown him on earlier days still, he would not, like Falkland, have died in germinating peace. He would have fought. But on which side, no friend of his, up till now, could have been quite sure? To have the reputation of an idler, and to be in truth a plodding and unwearied student, this, at any rate, pleased him. To avow an enthusiasm or an affection generally seemed to him an indelicacy. Only two or three people in the world knew what was the real quality of his heart. Yet no man feigns shirking without, in some measure, learning to shirk, and there were certain true indolences and sybaritisms in Ash of which he was fully and contemptuously aware, without either wishing or feeling himself able to break the yoke of them. At the present moment, however, he was rather conscious of much unusual stirring and exultation of personality. As he stood looking out into the English night, the currents of his blood ran free and fast. Never had he felt the natural appetite for living so strong in him, combined with what seemed to be at once a divination of coming change, and a thirst for it. Was it the mere advancement of his fortunes, or something infinitely subtler and sweeter? It was as though waves of softness and of yearning welled up from some unknown source, seeking an object and an outlet. As he stood there dreaming, he suddenly became conscious of sounds in the room overhead, or rather, in the now absolute stillness of the rest of the house, he realised that the movements and voices above him, which had really been going on since he entered his room, persisted when everything else had died away. Two people were talking, or rather, one voice ran on perpetually, broken at intervals by the other. He began to suspect to whom the voice belonged, and as he did so, the window above his own was thrown open. He stepped back involuntarily, but not before he had caught a few words in French, spoken apparently by Lady Kitty. Ciel, what a night! And how the flowers smell! And the stars, I adore the stars! Mademoiselle, come here. Mademoiselle, answer me. I won't tell tales. Now do you really and truly believe in God? A laugh, which was a laugh of pleasure, ran through Ash as he hurriedly put out his lights. Tormentor, he said to himself, must you put a woman through her theological paces at this time of night? Can't you go to sleep, you little whirlwind? What's to be done? If I shut my window, the noise will scare her. But I can't stand eavesdropping here. He withdrew softly from the window and began to undress. But Lady Kitty was leaning out, and her voice carried amazingly. Heard in this way also, apart from form and face, it became a separate living thing. Ash stood arrested, his watch that he was winding up in his hand. He had known the voice till now as something sharp and light, a sign surely of a chatterer and a flirt. Tonight, as Kitty made use of it to expound her own peculiar theology, to the French governess, whereof a few fragments now and then floated down to ash, nothing could have been more musical, melancholy, caressing, a voice full of sex, and of the spell of sex. What had she been talking of all these hours to Mademoiselle? A lady whom she could never have set eyes on before this visit. He thought of her face in the drawing-room as she had spoken of her sister, of her eyes so full of a bright, feverish pain which are hung upon his own. 
Had she indeed been confiding all her home secrets to this stranger? Ash felt a movement of distaste, almost of disgust. Yet he remembered that it was by her unconventionality, her lack of all proper reticence, or, as many would have said, all delicate feeling, that she had made her first impression upon him. Aye, that had been an impression, an impression indeed. He realised the fact profoundly as he stood lingering in the darkness, trying not to hear the voice that thrilled him. At last, was she going to bed? Ah, but I am a pig to keep you up like this. Allez dormir. The sound of a kiss. I? Oh, no. Why should one go to bed? It is the night one begins to live. She felt a humming a little French tune, then broke off. You remember? You promise? You have the letter? A separation, apparently, from Mademoiselle, and a mention of eight o'clock, followed by remorse from Kitty. Eight o'clock, and I keep you like this. I am a brute beast. Allez, allez vite! And quick steps guided across the floor above, followed by the shutting of a door. Kitty, however, came back to the window, and Ash could still hear her sighing and talking to herself. What had she been plotting? A letter? Conveyed by Mademoiselle? To whom? Long after all sounds above had ceased, Ash still lay awake, thinking of the story he had heard from Lord Grosville. Certainly, if he had known it, he would never have gone familiarly to Madame Destre's house. Laxity, for a man of his type, is one thing. Lying, meanness and cruelty are another. What could be done for this poor child in her strange and sinister position? He was ironically conscious of a sudden heat of missionary zeal. For if the creature, to be saved, had not possessed such a pair of eyes, so slim a neck, such a haunting and teasing personality, what then? The question presently plunged with him into sleep. But he had not forgotten it when he awoke. He just finished dressing next morning when he chanced to see from the front window of his room, which commanded the main stretch of the park, the figure of a lady on one of the paths. She seemed to be returning from the farther end of a long avenue, and was evidently hurrying to reach the house. As she approached Trevor, she turned aside into a shrubbery walk, and was soon lost to view. But Ash had recognised Mademoiselle D. The matter of the letter recurred to him. He guessed that she had already delivered it. But where? At breakfast, Lady Kitty did not appear. Ash made inquiries of the younger Miss Grosville, who replied, with some tartness, that she supposed Kitty had a cold, and hurried off herself to dress for Sunday school. It was not at all the custom for young ladies to breakfast in bed on Sundays at Grosville Park, and Lady Grosville's brow was clouded. Ash felt it a positive effort to tell her that he was not going to church, and when she had marshalled her flock and carried them off, those left behind knew themselves indeed as heathens and publicans. Ash wandered out with some official papers and a pipe into the spring sunshine. Mr Kershaw, the editor, would gladly have caught him for a political talk, but Ash would not be caught. As to the interests of England in the Persian Gulf, both they and Mr Kershaw might for the moment go hang. Would Lady Kitty meet him in the old garden at 11.30, or would she not? That was the only thing that mattered. However, it was still more than an hour to the time mentioned. Ash spent a while in roaming a wood delicately pied with primroses and anemones, and then sauntered back into the gardens, which were old and famous. Suddenly, as he came upon a terrace bordered by a thick yew hedge, and descending by steps to a lower terrace, he became aware of voices in a strange tone and key, not loud, but as it were intensified far beyond the note of ordinary talk. Ash stood still, for he had recognised the voice of Lady Kitty. But before he had made up his mind what to do, a lady began to ascend the steps which connected the upper terrace with the lower. She came straight towards him, and Ash looked at her with astonishment. She was not a member of the Graceville House Party, and Ash had never seen her before. Yet, in her pale, unhappy face, there was something that recalled another person. Something, too, in her gait and her passionate energy of movement. She swept past him, and he saw that she was tall and thin, 
and dressed in deep mourning. Her eyes were set on some inner vision. He felt that she scarcely saw him. She passed like an embodied grief, menacing and lamentable. Something like a cry pursued her up the steps, but she did not turn. She walked swiftly on and was soon lost to sight in the trees. Ash hesitated a moment and then hurried her down the steps. On a stone seat beneath the yew hedge, Kitty Bristol lay prone. He heard her sobs, and they went most strangely through his heart. Lady Kitty, he said, as he stood beside her and bent over her. She looked up and showed no surprise. Her face was bathed in tears, but her hand sought his piteously and drew him towards her. I have seen my sister, she said, and she hates me. What have I done? I think I shall die of despair. End of Part 1, Chapter 4Part 1, Chapter 5 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 1, Chapter 5. The effect of the few sobbing words with which Kitty Bristol had greeted his presence beside her upon the feeling of William Ash was both sharp and deep, for they seemed already to imply a peculiar relation, a special link between them. Had it not indeed begun in that very moment at St. James's Place, when he had first caught sight of her, sitting forlorn in her white dress, when she had willed him to come to her, and he came? Surely, though as to this he had his qualms, she could not have spoken with this abandonment to any other of her new English acquaintances. To Darrell, for instance, who was expected at Grosville Park that evening? No. From the beginning she had turned to him, William Ash. She had been conscious of the same mutual understanding the same sympathy in difference that he himself felt. It was, at any rate, with the feeling of one whose fate has most strangely, most unexpectedly overtaken him, that he sat down beside her. His own pulses were running at a great rate, but there was to be no sign of it for her. He tried, indeed, to calm her by that mere cheerful strength and vitality of which he was so easily master. "'Why should you be in despair?' he said, bending towards her. Tell me, let me try and help you. Was your sister unkind to you? Kitty made no reply at once. The tears that brimmed her large eyes slipped down her cheeks without disfiguring her. She was looking absently, intently, into a dark depth of wood, as though she sought there for some truth that escaped her, truth of the past or of the present. I don't know, she said at last, shaking her head. I don't know whether it was unkind. Perhaps it was only what we deserved, Mamma and I. You? cried Ash. Yes, she said passionately. Who's going to separate between Mamma and me? If she's done mean, shocking things, the people she's done them to will hate me too. They shall hate me. It's right. She turned to him violently. She was very white, and her little hands, as she sat there before him, proudly erect, twisted a lace handkerchief between them that would soon be in tatters. Somehow Ash winced before the wreck of the handkerchief. What need to ruin the pretty, fragile thing? I am quite sure no one will ever hate you for what you haven't done, he said steadily. That would be abominably unfair. But you see, I don't understand, and I don't like, I, I don't wish, to ask questions. Do ask questions, she cried, looking at him almost reproachfully. That's just what I want you to do. Only, she added, hanging her head in depression, I shouldn't know what to answer. I am played with and treated as a baby. There is something horrible the matter, and no one trusts me. Everyone keeps me in the dark. No one ever thinks whether I am miserable or not. She raised her hands to her eyes and vehemently wiped away the tears with the tattered lace handkerchief. In all these words and actions, however, she was graceful and touching, because she was natural. She was not posing or conscious. She was hiding nothing. Yet Ash felt certain she could act a part magnificently. Only it would not be for the lie's sake, but for the sake of some romantic impulse or imagination. 
Why should you torment yourself so? He asked her kindly. Her hand had dropped and lay beside her on the bench. To his own amazement, he found himself clasping it. Isn't it better to forget old griefs? You can't help what happened years ago. You can't undo it. You've got to live your own life, happily. And I just wish you'd set about it. He smiled at her, and there were few faces more attractive than his when he let his natural softness have its way without irony. She let her eyes be drawn to his, and as they met he saw a flush rise in her clear skin and spread to the pale gold of her hair. The man in him was marvellously pleased by that flush, fascinated indeed. But she gave him small time to observe it. She drew herself impatiently away. Of course, you don't understand a word about it, she said, or you couldn't talk like that. But I'll tell you. Her eyes, half miserable, half audacious, returned to him. My sister came here because I sent for her. I made Mademoiselle go with a letter. Of course, I knew there was a mystery. I knew the Grosvilles did not want us to meet. I knew that she and Maman hated each other. But Maman would tell me nothing, and I have a right to know. No, you have no right to know, said Ash gravely. She looked at him wildly. I have, I have, she repeated passionately. Well, I told my sister to meet me here. I've forgotten, you see, all about you. My mind was so full of Alice. And when she came, I felt as if it was a dream, a horrible, tragic dream. You know, she's so like me. Which means, I suppose, that we're both like Papa. Only her face, it's not handsome, oh no, but it's stern and, yes, noble. I was proud of her. I would like to have gone on my knee and kissed her dress. But she would not take my hand. She would hardly speak to me. She said she'd come because it was best, now that I was in England, that we should meet once and understand that we couldn't meet, that we could never, never be friends. She said that she hated my mother, that for years she had kept silence, but that now she meant to punish Maman, to drive her from London. And then... The girl's lips trembled under the memory. She came close to me and she looked into my eyes and she said, Yes, we're like each other. We're like our father. And it would be better for us both if we had never been born. Ah, cruel, said Nash involuntarily. And once more his hand found Kitty's small fingers and pressed them in his. Kitty looked at him with a strange, exalted look. No, I think it's true. I often think I'm not made to be happy. I can't ever be happy. It's not in me. It's in you to say foolish things, then, said Ash, lightly. And, crossing his arms, he tried to, to assume the practical elder brotherly air which he felt befitted the situation, if anything befitted it. For in truth it seemed to him one singularly confused and ugly. Their talk floated above tragic depths, guessed at by him, wholly unknown to her. And yet her youth shrank from it, knew not what, as an animal shrinks from shadows in the twilight. She seemed to him to sit enwrapped in a vague cloud of shame, resenting and hating it, yet not able to escape from thinking and talking of it. But she must not talk of it. She did not answer his last remark for a little while. She sat looking before her, overwhelmed, it seemed, by an inward rush of images and sensations. Till, with a sudden movement, she turned to him and said, smiling, quite in her ordinary voice, Do you know why I shall never be happy? It is because I have such a bad temper. Have you? said Ash, smiling. She gave him a curious look. You don't believe it? If you'd been in the convent, you would have believed it. I'm mad sometimes, quite mad. With pride, I suppose, and vanity. The sirs said it was that. They had to explain it somehow, said Ash. But I'm quite sure that if I lived in a convent, I should have had a furious temper. You, she said half contemptuously. You couldn't be ill-tempered anywhere. That's the one thing I don't like about you. You're too calm, too, too satisfied. It's, well, you said a sharp thing to me, so I don't see why I shouldn't say one to you. You shouldn't look as though you enjoyed your life so much. It's bourgeois. It is indeed. And she frowned upon him with a little extravagant air that amused him. By some prescience, she put on that morning a black dress of thin material, 
made with extreme simplicity. No flounces, no fanfaronade. A little girlish dress that made the girlish figure seem even frailer and lighter than he remembered it the night before in the splendours of her Paris gown. Her large black hat emphasised the whiteness of her brow, the brilliance of her most beautiful eyes. And then all the rest was insubstantial, sprite and airy nothing, to be crushed in one hand. And yet what untamed, indomitable things breathed from it, a self surely more self, more intensely, obstinately alive than any he had yet known. Her attack had brought the involuntary blood to his cheeks, which annoyed him. But he invited her to say why cheerfulness was a vice. She replied that no one should look success as much as he did. And you scorn success? Scorn it? She drew a long breath, clasped both her hands above her head, then slowly let the thin arms fall again. Scorn it? What nonsense! But everybody who hasn't got it hates those who have. Don't hate me, said Ash quickly. Yes, she said with stubbornness, I must. Do you know why I was such a wild cat at school? Because some of the other girls were more important than I, much more important and richer and more beautiful, and people paid them more attention. And that seemed to burn the heart in me. She pressed her hands to her breast with a passionate gesture. You know the French word panache? Well, that's what I care for. That's what I adore. To be the first, the best, the most distinguished. To be envied and pointed at, obeyed when I lift my finger. And then come to some great, glorious, tragic end. Ash moved impatiently. Lady Kitty, I don't like to hear you talk like this. It's wild and it's also... I beg your pardon. In bad taste, she said, catching him up breathlessly. That's what you mean, isn't it? You said to me before when I called you handsome. Pshaw, he said in vexation. She watched him throw himself back and feel for his cigarette case. A gesture of her hand gave him leave. She waited, smiling, till he had taken a few calming whiffs. Then she gently moved towards him. Don't be angry with me, she said in a sweet, low voice. Don't you understand how hard it is to have that nature? and then to come here out of the convent, where one had lived on dreams, and find oneself. She turned her head away. Ash put down his new lit cigarette. Find yourself, he repeated. Everybody scorns me, she said, her brow drooping. Ash exclaimed. You know it's true. My mother is not received. Can you deny that? She has many friends, said Ash. She is not received. When I speak of her, no one answers me. Lady Grosville asked me here, me, out of charity. It would be thought a disgrace to marry me. Look here, Lady Kitty. And I, she wrung her small hands as though she clasped the necks of her enemies, I would never look at a man who did not think it the glory of his life to win me. So you see, I shall never marry. But then the dreadful thing is, she let him see a white, stormy face that I have no loyalty to Mamma. I, I don't think I even love her. Ash surveyed her gravely. You don't mean that, he said. I think I do, she persisted. I had a horrid childhood. I won't tell tales, but you say I don't know Mamma. I know the sir much better. And then for someone you don't know to have to, to have to bear this, this horrible thing, she buried her face in her hands. Ash looked at her in perplexity. You shan't bear anything horrible, he said with energy. There are plenty of people who will take care of that. Do you mind telling me, have there been special difficulties just lately? Oh, yes, she said calmly, looking up. Awful. Mummel's debts are, well, ridiculous. But that alone I don't think she'll be able to stay in London, apart from Alice. The name recalled all she had just passed through, and her face quivered. What will she do? she said under her breath. How will she punish us? And why? For what? Her dread, her ignorance, her fierce, bruised vanity, her struggling pride, her helplessness, 
appealed amazingly to the man beside her. He began to talk to her very gently and wisely, begging her to let the past alone, to think only what could be done to help the present. In the first place, would she not let his mother be of use to her? He could answer for Lady Tramwell, why shouldn't Lady Kitty spend the summer with her in Scotland? No doubt Madame Destre would be abroad. Then I must go with her, said Kitty. Ash hesitated. Of course, if she wishes it. But I don't know that she will wish it. She's not very fond of me, said Kitty doubtfully. Yes, I would like to stay with Lady Tramwell. But will your cousin be there? Miss Lister? Kitty nodded. How can I tell? Of course she is often there. It is quite curious, said Kitty, after reflection, how we dislike each other. And it is so odd. You know most people like me. She looked up at him without a trace of coquetry, rather with a certain timidity that feared a possible rebuff. That's always been my difficulty, she went on. Till now, everybody spoils me. I always get my own way. In the convent I was indulged and flattered, and then they wondered that I made all sorts of follies. I want a guide, that's quite certain. Somebody to tell me what to do. I would offer myself for the post, said Ash, but that I feel perfectly sure that you would never follow anybody's advice in anything. Yes, I would, she said wistfully. I would. Ash's face changed. Ah, if you would. She sprang up. Do you see? She pointed to some figures on a distant path. They're coming back from church. You understand? Nobody must know about my sister. It will come round to Aunt Lena, of course, but I hope it'll be when I'm gone. If she knew now, I should go back to London today. Ash made it clear to her that he would be discretion himself. They left the bench, but as they began to ascend the steps, Kitty turned back. I wish I hadn't seen her, she said in a miserable tone, the tears flooding once more into her eyes. Ash looked at her with great kindness, but without speaking. The moment of sharp pain passed, and she moved on languidly beside him. But there was an infection in his strong, handsome presence, and her smile soon came back. By the time they neared the house, indeed, she seemed to be in wild spirits again. Did he know, she asked him, that three more guests were coming that afternoon, Mr. Darrell, Mr. Lewis Harmon, and Mr. Geoffrey Cliff? She laid an emphasis on the last name, which made Ash say carelessly, You want to meet him so much? Of course, doesn't all the world? Ash replied that he could only answer for himself, and as far as he was concerned, he could do very well without Cliff's company at all times. Whereupon Kitty protested with fire that other men were jealous of such a famous person because women liked him, because... Because the man's a coxcomb and the women spoil him. A coxcomb? Kitty was up in arms. Pray, is he not a great traveller, a very great traveller? She asked with indignation. Certainly, by his own account. And a most brilliant writer? Macaulay is, said Ash perversely, not very good at that. Kitty was at first struck dumb, and then began a voluble protest against unfairness so monstrous. Did not all intelligent people read and admire? It was mere jealousy, she repeated, to deny the gentleman's claims. Ash let her talk and croak and excite herself, applying every now and then a little sly touch of the goad to make her still run on, and to forget the tragic hour which had overshadowed her. And meanwhile, all he cared for was to watch the flashing of her face and eyes, and the play of the wind in her hair, and the springing grace with which she moved. Poor child! It all came back to that. Poor child! What was to be done with her? At luncheon, the Sunday luncheon, which still at Grosville Park, as in the early Victorian days of Lord Grosville's mother, consisted of a huge baronial sirloin to which all else upon the varied table appeared as a pertinence and appendage. Ash allowed himself the inward reflection that the Grosville Park Sundays were degenerating. Both Lord and Lady Grosville had been good hosts in their day, 
and the downrightness of the wife have been as much to the taste of many as the agreeable gossip of the husband. But on this occasion both were silent and absent-minded. Lady Graceful showed no generalship in placing her guests. The wrong people sat next to each other, and the whole party dragged without a leader. And certainly Kitty Bristol did nothing to enliven it. She sat very silent, her black dress changing her a good deal to ashes thinking, bringing back, as he chose to fancy, a pale convent girl. Was it so that she went through her pious exercises? By the way, she was, of course, a Catholic. Said her lessons, went to her confessor. Had the French cousin with whom she rode stank hunting ever seen her like this? No, Ash felt certain that Henri had never seen her except as a fashion place or en Amazon. He could have made nothing of this ghost in black, this distinguished, piteous little ghost. After luncheon it became tolerably clear to Ash that Lady Graceful's preoccupation had a cause. And, presently catching him alone in the library, whither he had retired with some official papers, she closed the door with deliberate care and stood before him. I see you are interested in Kitty, and I feel as if I must tell you and ask your opinion. William, do you know what that child has been doing? He looked up from his writing. Ah, what have you been discovering? Graceful told you the story last night? Ash nodded. Well, Kitty wrote to Alice this morning, and they met. Alice has kept her room since. Prostrate, so the Sarbys tell me. I've just had a note from Mrs. Sarby. Wasn't it an extraordinary and indelicate thing to do? Ash studied the frowning lady a moment, so large and daunting in her black silk and white lace. She seemed to suggest all those aspects of the English Sunday for which he had the most secret dislike, with Phariseeism and dullness and heavy meals. He felt herself through and through Lady Kitty's champion. I should have thought it very natural, was his reply. Lady Graceful threw up her hands. Natural? When she knows? How can she know? cried Ash hotly. How can such a child know or guess anything? She only knows that there is some black charge against her mother on which no one would enlighten her. How can they? But meanwhile, her mother is ostracised and she feels herself dragged into the disgrace, not understanding why or wherefore. Could anything more pathetic, more touching? In his heat of feeling, he got up and began to pace up and down. Lady Graceville's countenance expressed first astonishment, then wavering. Oh, of course, it's very sad, she said, extremely sad. But I should have thought Kitty was clever enough to understand at least that Alice must have some grave reason for breaking with her mother. Don't you all forget what a child she is, said Ash indignantly. Not yet nineteen. Yes, that's true, said Lady Graceful grudgingly. I must confess I find it difficult to judge her fairly. She's so different from my own girls. Ash hastily agreed. Then it struck him as odd that he should have fallen so quickly into this position of Kitty's defender with her father's family, and he drew in his horns. He resumed his work, and Lady Graceful sat for a while, her hands in her lap, quietly observing him. At last she said, So you think, William, I had better leave Kitty alone? About what? Ash raised his curly head with a laugh. Don't put too much responsibility on me. I know nothing about young ladies. I don't know that I do much, said Lady Graceful candidly. My own daughters are so exceptional. Ash held his peace. Distant cousins as they were, he hardly knew the Graceful girls apart, and had never yet grasped any reason why he should. At any rate, I see clearly, said Lady Graceful, after another pause, that you're very sorry for Kitty. Of course, it's very nice of you, and I find it's what most people feel. Hang it, dear Lady Graceville, why shouldn't they? said Ash, turning round on his chair. If ever there was a forlorn little person on earth, I thought Lady Kitty was that person at lunch today. And after that absurd exhibition last night, said Lady Graceville, with a shrug, you never know where to have her. You think she looked ill? I'm sure she's got a splitting headache, said Ash, boldly. And why you and Graceville shouldn't be as sorry for her as for Lady Alice, I can't imagine. 
She's done nothing. No, that's true, said Lady Graceful, as she rose. Then she added, I'll go and see if she has a headache. You must consult with us, William. You know the mother so well. Oh, I'm no good, said Ash, with energy. But I'm sure the kindness would pay with Lady Kitty. Lady Graceful stared. I hope we are always kind to her, she said with a touch of haughtiness, and then the library door closed behind her. Kindness was indeed that afternoon the order of the day, as from the Grosfields to Lady Kitty. Ash wondered whether she liked it. The girls followed her about with shawls. Lady Grosfield installed her on a sofa in the back drawing room. A bottle of sal volatile appeared and Caroline Grosfield instead of going twice to Sunday school, devoted herself to fanning Kitty, though the weather, which was sunny with a sharp east wind, suggested to Ash's thinking fires rather than fans. He was himself carried off for the customary Sunday walk, Mr Kershaw being now determined to claim the sacred rights of the press. The walkers left the house by a garden door, to reach which they had to pass through the farther drawing room. Kitty, a picturesque figure on the sofa, nodded farewell to Ash, and then, unseen by Caroline Grosville, who sat behind her, shot him a last look which drove him to a precipitate exit, lest the inward laugh should out. The walk through the flat Cambridge country was long and strenuous, though for at least half of it the active journalist who was Ash's companion conceived the poorest opinion of the new minister. Ash knew nothing had no opinions, cared for nothing, except now and then for the stalking of an unfamiliar bird, or the antics of the dogs, or tales of horse-racing, of which he talked with a fervour entirely denied to those high political topics of which Kershaw's ardent soul was full. Again and again did the journalists put them under his nose in their most attractive guise. In vain. Ash would have none of them till suddenly a chance word started an Indian frontier question, vastly important and totally unknown to the English public. Ash casually began to talk. The trickle became a stream, and presently he was holding forth with an impetuosity, a knowledge, a matured and careful judgment that fairly amazed the man beside him. The long road, bordered by the flat fen meadows, the wide silver sky, the gently lengthening day, all passed unnoticed. The journalist found himself in the grip of a mind, strong, active, rich. He gave himself up with docility, yet with a growing astonishment, and when they stood once more on the steps of the house, he said to his companion, You must have followed these matters for years. Why have you never spoken in the house or written anything? Ash's aspect changed at once. What would have been the good? he said with his easy smile. The fellows who didn't know wouldn't have believed me, and the fellows who knew didn't want telling. A shade of impatience showed in Kershaw's aspect. I thought, he said, ours was government by discussion. Ash laughed, and turning on the steps, he pointed to the splendid gardens and finely wooded park. Or government by country houses, which, if you support us in this, as I gather you will, this walk will have been worth a debate, now won't it? The flattered journalist smiled, and they entered the house. From the inner hall, Lord Graceville perceived them. Geoffrey Cliff's arrived, he said to Ash as they reached him. Has he? said Ash, and turned to go upstairs. But Kershaw showed a lively interest. You mean the traveller? he asked of his host. I do, as mad as usual, said the old man. He and my niece Kitty make a pair. End of Part 1 Chapter 5 Part 1 Chapter 6 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Part 1 Chapter 6 when Ash returned to the drawing-room, he found it filled with the sound of talk and laughter. But it was a talk and laughter in which the Grosville family seemed to have itself but little part. Lady Grosville sat stiffly on an early Victorian sofa, her spectacles on her nose, 
reading the times of the preceding day, or appearing to read it. Amy Gracefield, the eldest girl, was busy in a corner, putting the finishing touches to a piece of illumination, whilst Caroline, seated on the floor, was showing the small child of a neighbour how to put a picture puzzle together. Lord Gracefield was professedly in a father room, talking with the Austrian Count, but every other minute he strolled restlessly into the big drawing room and stood at the edge of the talk and laughter, only to turn on his heel again and go back to the Count, who meanwhile appeared in the opening between the two rooms, his hands on his hips, eagerly watching Kitty Bristol and her companions, while waiting, as courtesy bade him, for the return of his host. Ash at once divined that the Grosville family were in revolt, nor had he to look far to discover the cause. Was that astonishing young lady in truth identical with the pensive figure of the morning? Kitty had doffed her black, and she wore a demi-toilette gown of the utmost elegance, of which the expensiveness had no doubt already sunk deep into Lady Grosville's soul. At Graceville Park, the new fashion of tea gowns was not favourably regarded. It was thought to be a mere device of silly and extravagant women, and an afternoon dress, though of greater pretensions than a morning gown, was still a sober affair, not in any way to be confounded with those decorative effects that nature and sound sense reserved for the evening. But Kitty's dress was of some white silky material, and it displayed her slender throat and some portion of her thin white arms. The dean's wife, Mrs Winston, as she secretly studied it, felt an inward satisfaction, for here at last was one of those gowns she had once or twice gazed on with covetous awe in the shop windows of the Rue de la Paix, brought down to earth and clothing a simple mortal. They were then real, and they could be worn by real women, which till now the dean's wife had scarcely believed. Alack, how becoming were these concoctions to minxes with fair hair and sylph-like frames! Kitty was radiant, triumphant, and Ash was certain that Lady Gracefield knew it, however she might barricade herself behind at the times. The girl's slim fingers gesticulated in aid of her tongue. One tiny foot swung lightly over the other. The glistening folds of the silk wrapped her in a shimmering whiteness, above which the fair head, negligently thrown back, shone out on a red background made by the velvet chair in which she sat. The dean was placed close beside her, and was clearly enjoying himself enormously. And in front of her, absorbed in her, engaged indeed in hot and furious debate with her, stood the great man who had just arrived. "'How do you do, Cliff?' said Ash, as he approached. Geoffrey Cliff turned sharply, and a perfunctory greeting passed between the two men. "'When did you arrive?' said Ash, as he threw himself into an armchair. "'Last Tuesday, but that doesn't matter,' said Cliff impatiently. Nothing matters, except that I must somehow defeat Lady Kitty. And he stood looking down upon the girl in front of him, his hands on his sides, his queer countenance twitching with suppressed laughter. An odd figure, tall, spare, loosely jointed, surmounted by a pale parchment face, which showed a somewhat protruding chin, a long and delicate nose, and fine brows under a strange overhanging mass of fair hair. He had the dissipated, battered look of certain Van Dyke cavaliers, and certainly no handsomeness of any accepted kind. But, as Ashwell knew, the aspect and personality of Geoffrey Cliff possessed for innumerable men and women, in English society and out of it, a fascination it was easy to laugh at and to explain. Lady Kitty had eyes certainly for no one else. When he spoke of defeating her, she laughed her defiance, and a glance of battle passed between her and Cliff. Cliff, still holding her with his look, considered what new ground to break. "'What is the subject?' I said Ash. "'That men are vainer than women,' said Kitty. "'It's so true it's hardly worth saying, isn't it? Mr Cliff talks nonsense about our love of clothes, and of being admired, as if that were vanity. Of course it's only our sense of duty.' "'Duty?' cried Cliff, twisting his moustache. To whom? To the men, of course. If we didn't like clothes, if we didn't like being admired, where would you be? Personally, I could get on, said Cliff. You expect us to be too much on our knees. As if we should ever get you there, if it didn't amuse you, said Kitty. Hypocrites. 
we don't dress, paint, chatter, and tell lies for you, he won't look at us. And if we do... Of course, it all depends on how well it's done, threw in Cliff. Kitty laughed. That's judging by results. I looked to the motive. I repeat, if I powder and paint, it's not because I obey, but because it's my painful duty to give you pleasure. And if it doesn't give me pleasure? She shrugged her shoulders. Call me stupid, then, not vain. I ought to have done it better. In any case, said Ash, it's your duty to please us. Yes, sighed Kitty. Worse luck. And she sank softly back in her chair, her eyes shining under the stimulus of a laugh that ran through her circle. The dean joined in it uneasily, conscious no doubt of the sharp, crackling movements by which in the distance Lady Crosville was dumbly expressing herself through the times. Cliff looked at the small figure a moment, then seized a chair and sat down in front of her, astride. "'I wonder why you want to please us,' he said abruptly, his magnificent blue eyes upon her. "'Ah,' said Kitty, throwing up her hands, "'if we only knew!' "'You find it in the tragedy of your sex?' "'Poor comedy,' said the dean, rising. "'I take you at it by your word, Lady Kitty. "'Tonight it will be your duty to please me. "'Remember, you promised to say us some more French.' "'He lifted an admonitory finger. "'I don't know any Atterley,' said Kitty demurely, "'crossing her hands upon her knee. "'The dean smiled to himself as he crossed the room to Lady Grisville, "'and endeavoured by an impartial criticism of the new curate's manner and voice, "'as they had revealed themselves in church that morning, to distract her attention from her niece. A hopeless task, for Kitty's personality was of the kind which absorbs, engulfs attention, do what the bystander will. Eyes and ears were drawn perforce into the little whirlpool that she made, their owners yielding them, now with delight, now with repulsion. Mary Lister, for instance, came in presently, fresh from a walk with Lady Edith Banley. She too had changed her dress, but it was a discreet and reasonable change, and Lady Graceville looked at her soft grey gown with its muslin collar and cuffs, delicately embroidered, and yet of a nun-like cut and air notwithstanding, with a hot energy of approval, provoked entirely by Kitty's audacities. Mary, meanwhile, raised her eyebrows gently at the sight of Kitty. She swept past the group, giving a cool greeting to Geoffrey Cliff, and presently settled herself in the farther room, attended by Louise Harmon and Darrell, who had just arrived by the afternoon train. Clearly, she observed Kitty and observed her with dislike. The attitude of her companions was not so simple. "'What an amazing young woman,' said Harmon presently, under his breath, yet open mouthed. "'I suppose she and Cliff are old friends.' "'I believe they never met before,' said Mary. Darrell laughed. Lady Kitty makes short work of the preliminaries, he said, and she told me the other night life wasn't long enough to begin with talk about the weather. The weather, said Harmon. At the present moment she and Cliff seem to be discussing the Dame aux Camellia. Since when did they take young girls to see that kind of thing in Paris? Miss Lister gave a little cough, and bending forward said to Harmon, Lady Tramore has shown me your picture. It is a dear, delicious thing. I never saw anything more heavenly than the angel." Harmon smiled a flattered smile. Mary Lister referred to a copy of a Filippo Lippi Annunciation, which he had just executed in watercolour for Lady Tranmore, to whom he was devoted. He was, however, devoted to a good many peeresses, with whom he took tea, and for whom he undertook many harmless and elegant services. He painted their portraits, in small size, after pre-Raphaelite models, and he occasionally presented them with copies, a little weak, but charming, of their favourite Italian pictures. He and Mary began now to talk of Florence with much enthusiasm and many caressing adjectives. For Harmon, most things were sweet, for Mary, interesting or suggestive. She talked fast and fluently. A subtle observer might have guessed she wished it to be seen that for her, Lady Kitty Bristol's flirtations, be they in or out of taste, were simply non-existent. Darrell listened intermittently, watched Cliff and Lady Kitty, and thought a good deal. That extraordinary girl was certainly carrying on with Cliff, as she had carried on with Ash on the night of her first acquaintance with him in St James's Place. Ash apparently took it with equanimity, for he was still sitting beside the pair, twisting a paper-knife and smiling, 
sometimes putting in a word, but more often silent, and apparently of no account at all to either Kitty or Clem. Darrell knew that the new minister disliked and despised Geoffrey Cliff. He was aware, too, that Cliff returned to these sentiments, and was not unlikely to be found attacking Ash in public before long on certain points of foreign policy, where Cliff conceived himself to be a master. The meeting of the two men under the Grossfield's roof struck Darrell as curious. Why had Cliff been invited by these very respectable and straight-laced people, the Grossfields? Darrell could only reflect that Lady Eleanor Cliff, the traveller's mother, was probably connected with them by some of those innumerable and ever-ramifying links that hold together a certain large group of English families, and that, moreover, Lady Grossville, in spite of philanthropy and evangelicalism, had always shown a rather pronounced taste in lions of the masculine sort. Of the women to be with at Grossville Park, one could be certain. Lady Grossville made no excuses for her own sex, but she was a sufficiently ambitious hostess to know that agreeable parties are not constructed out of the saints alone. The men, therefore, must provide the sinners, and of some of the persons then most in vogue she was careful not to know too much. For, socially, one must live, and that being so, the strictness of today may have had at any moment to be purchased by the laxity of tomorrow. Such, at any rate, was Darrell's analysis of the situation. He was still astonished, however, when all was said. For Cliff, during the preceding winter, on his return from some remarkable travels in Persia, had paused on the Riviera, and an affair at Cannes with a French vicomtesse had got into the English papers. No one knew the exact truth of it, and a small volume of verse by Cliff, published immediately afterwards, verse very distinguished, passionate and obscure, had offered many clues, but no solution whatever. May be to suppose, however, that the story was anything but a bad one. Moreover, the last book of travels, which had had an enormous success, contained one of the most malicious attacks on foreign missions that Darrell remembered. And, if the missionaries had a supporter in England, it was Lady Grosville. Had she designs, material designs, on behalf of Miss Amy or Miss Caroline? Darrell smiled at the notion. Cliff must certainly marry money, and was not to be captured by any Miss Amy's, or Lady Kitty's either, for the matter of that. But, Darrell glanced at the lady beside him, and his busy thoughts took a new turn. He'd seen the greeting between Miss Lister and Cliff. It was cold. But all the same, the world knew that they had once been friends. Was it some five years before that Miss Lister, then in the height of a brilliant season under the wing of Lady Tramwell, had been much seen in public with Geoffrey Cliff? Then he had departed eastward to explore the upper waters of the Mekong, and the gossip excited had died away. Of late, her name had been rather coupled with that of William Ash. Well, so far as the world was concerned, she might mate with either the mad notoriety of Cliff or the young distinction of Ash. Darrell's bitter heart contracted as he reflected that only for him and the likes of him, men of the people with average ability and a scarcely average income, were maidens of Mary Lister's dower and pedigree out of reach. Meanwhile, he revenged himself by being her very good friend and allowing himself at times much caustic plainness of speech in his talks with her. "'What are you three gossiping about?' said Ash, strolling in presently from the other room to join them. "'As usual,' said Darrell, "'I am listening to perfection. Miss Lister and Harmon are discussing pictures.' Ash stifled a little yawn. He threw himself down by Mary, vowing that there was no more pleasure to be got out of pictures now that people would try to know so much about them. Mary, meanwhile, raised herself involuntarily to look into the farther room, where the noise made by Cliff and Lady Kitty had increased. "'They're going to sing,' said Ash lazily, "'and it won't be hymns.' In fact, Lady Kitty had opened the piano and had begun the first bars of something French and operatic. At the first sound of Kitty's music, however, Lady Grosville drew herself up, she closed the volume of evangelical sermons for which she had exchanged the times, and she deposited her spectacles sharply on the table beside her. Amy, Caroline. Those young ladies rose. 
so did Lady Graceville. Kitty, meanwhile, sat with suspended fingers and laughing eyes, waiting on her aunt's movements. Kitty, pray don't let me interfere with your playing, said Lady Graceville, with severe politeness. But perhaps you would kindly put it off for half an hour. I'm now going to read to the servants. Gracious, said Kitty, springing up. I was going to play Mr. Cliffsome Offenbach. Ah, but the piano can be heard in the library, and your cousin Amy plays the harmonium. Mon oh dieu, said Catty, we will be as quiet as mice. Oh, she made a quick step in pursuit of her aunt. Shall I come and sing, Aunt Lena? Ash, in his shelter behind Mary Lister, fell into a silent convulsion of laughter. Uh, no, no, thank you, said Lady Graceful hastily, and she rustled away, followed by her daughters. Kitty came flying into the inner room, followed by Cliff. "'What have I done?' she said, breathlessly addressing Carmen, who rose to meet her. "'May one play the piano here on Sundays?' "'May depend,' said Harmon, "'on what you play.' "'Who made your English Sunday?' said Kitty impetuously. "'Je vous demande. Who?' She threw her challenge to all the winds of heaven, standing tiptoe, her hands poised on the back of a chair, the smallest and most delicate of furies. A breath unmakes it as a breath that is made, said Clip. Come and play billiards, Lady Kitty. You said just now you played. Billiards, said Harmon, throwing up his hands. On Sunday, here? Can they hear the balls? said Kitty eagerly, with a gesture towards the library. Mary Lister, who had been perfunctorily looking at a book, laid it down. It would certainly greatly distress Lady Graceville, she said in a voice studiously soft, but on that account perhaps all the more significant. Kitty glanced at Mary, and Ash saw the sudden red in her cheek. She turned provokingly to Cliff. There's quite half an hour, isn't there, before one need dress? More, said Cliff. Come along. And he made for the door, which she held open for her. It was now Mary Lister's turn to flush. The rebuff had been so naked and unadorned. Ash rose as Kitty passed him. Why don't you come too? she said, pausing. There was a flash from eyes deep and dark beneath a pair of wilful brows. Aunt Lee would never be cross with you. Thank you, I should be delighted to, to play Buffer, but uh, unfortunately I have some work I must do before dinner. Must you? She looked at him uncertainly, then at Cliff. In the dusk of the large, heavily furnished room, the pale yet brilliant gold of her hair, her white dress, her slim energy and elegance, drew all their eyes, even Mary Lister's. I must, Ash repeated, smiling. I am glad your headache is so much better. It is not in the least better. Then you disguise it like a heroine. He stood beside her, looking down upon her, his height and strength measured against her smallness. Apparently his amused detachment, the slight dryness of his tone, annoyed her. She made a tart reply, and vanished through the door that Cliff held open for her. Ash retired to his own room, dealt with some foreign office work, and then allowed himself a meditative smoke. The click of the billiard balls had ceased abruptly about ten minutes after he had begun upon his papers. There had been voices in the hall... Lord Grosville, she thought, among them. And now all was silence. He thought of the events of the afternoon with mingled amusement and annoyance. Cliff was an unscrupulous fellow, and the child's head might be turned. She should be protected from him in future. He vowed she should. Lady Tramwell should take it in hand. She had been a match for Cliff in various other directions before this. What brought the man, with his notorious character and antecedents, to Graceville Park, one of the dwindling number of country houses in England where the old Puritan restrictions still held? It was said he was on the lookout for a post. Ash, indeed, happened to know it officially, and Lord Graceville had a good deal of influence. Moreover, failing an appointment, he was understood to be aiming at Parliament and office, and there were two safe county seats within the Graceville sphere. Yet even when he wants a thing, he can't behave himself in order to get it, thought Ash. Anybody else would have turned Sabbatarian for once and refrained from flirting with Grossville's niece. But that's Cliff all over. 
perhaps the best thing about him. He might have added that as Cliff was supposed to desire an appointment under either the Foreign Office or the Colonial Office, it might have been thought to his interest to show himself more urbane than he had in fact shown himself that afternoon to the new Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs. But Ash rarely or never indulged himself in reflections of that kind. Besides, he and Cliff knew each other too well for posing. There was a time when they had been on very friendly terms, and when Cliff had been constantly in his mother's drawing room. Lady Tramore had a weakness for influencing young men of family and ability, and Cliff, in fact, owed her a good deal. Then she had seen cause to think ill of him, and moreover his travels had taken him to the other side of the world. Ash was now well aware that Cliff reckoned on him as a hostile influence, and would not try either to deceive or to propitiate him. He thought Cliff had been disagreeably surprised to see him that afternoon. Perhaps it was the sudden sense of antagonism acting on the man's excitable nature that had made him fling himself into the wild nonsense he had talked with Lady Kitty. And thenceforward, Ash's thoughts were possessed by Kitty only. Kitty in her two aspects, in the morning and the afternoon. He dressed in a reverie and went downstairs still dreaming. At dinner he found himself responsible for Mary Lister. Kitty was on the other side of the table, widely separated both from himself and Cliff. She was in a little empire dress of blue and silver, as extravagantly simple as her gown of the afternoon had been extravagantly elaborate. Ash observed the furtive study that the graceful girls could not help bestowing upon her, upon her shoulder straps and long bare arms, upon her high waist and the blue and silver bands in her hair. Kitty herself sat in a pensive, proud silence. The dean was beside her, but she scarcely spoke to him, and as to the young man from the neighbourhood who had taken her in, he was to her as though he were not. Has there been a row? Ash inquired in a low voice of his companion. Mary looked at him quietly. Your graceful asked them not to play because of the servants. Good, said Ash. The servants were, of course, playing cards in the housekeeper's room. Not at all. They were singing hymns with Lady Grosville. Ash looked incredulous. Only the slavies and scullery maids that couldn't help themselves. Never mind. Was Lady Kitty amenable? She seems to have made Lord Grosville very angry. Lady Grosville and I smoothed him down. Did you? said Ash. That was nice of you. Mary coloured a little and did not reply. Presently Ash resumed. Aren't you as sorry for her as I am? For Lady Kitty? I should think she managed to amuse herself pretty well. She seems to me the most deplorable, tragic little person, said Ash slowly. Miss Lister laughed. I really don't see it, she said. Oh, yes, you do, he persisted, if you think a moment. Be kind to her, won't you? She drew herself up with a cold dignity. I confess that she's never attracted me in the least. Ash returned to his dinner, dimly conscious that he had spoken like a fool. When the ladies had withdrawn, the conversation fell on some important news from the Far East contained in the Sunday papers that Geoffrey Cliff had brought down, and presumed to form part of the dispatches which the two ministers staying in the house had received that afternoon by foreign office messenger. The government of Tehran was in one of its periodical fits of ill temper with England, had been meddling with Afghanistan, flirting badly with Russia, and bringing ridiculous charges against the British minister. An expedition to Bushir was talked of, and the radical press was on the warpath. The cabinet minister said little. A Lord Privy Seal, reverentially credited with advising royalty in its private affairs, need have no views on the Persian Gulf. But Ash was appealed to, and talked well. The minister of Tehran was an old friend of his, and he described the personal attacks made on him for political reasons by the Shah and his ministers, with a humour which kept the table entertained. Suddenly, Cliff interposed. He had been listening with restlessness, though Ash, with pointed courtesy, 
and once or twice included him in the conversation. And presently, at a somewhat dramatic moment, he met a statement of Ash's with a direct and violent contradiction. Ash flushed, and a duel began between the two men of which the company were soon silent spectators. Ash had the resources of official knowledge. Cliff had been recently on the spot, and pushed home the advantage of the eyewitness with a covert insolence which Ash bore with surprising carelessness and good temper. In the end, Cliff said some outrageous things, at which Ash laughed, and Lord Graceville abruptly dissolved the party. Ash went smiling out of the dining room, caressing a fine white spaniel as though nothing had happened. In crossing the hall, Harmon found himself alone with the Guidine, who looked serious and preoccupied. That was a curious spectacle, said Harmon. Ash's equanimity was amazing. I'd rather have seen him angrier, said the dean slowly. He was always a very tolerant, easy-going fellow. The dean shook his head. A touch of suave indignatio now and then would complete him. Has he got it in him? Perhaps not, said the little dean, with a flash of expression that dignified all his frail person. But without it he would hardly make a great man. Meanwhile, Geoffrey Cliff, his strange, twisted face still vindictively aglow, made his way to Kitty Bristol's corner in the drawing-room. Mary Lister was conscious of it, conscious also of a certain look that Kitty bestowed upon the entrance of Ash, while Cliff was opening a battery of mingled chaff and compliments that did not at first have much effect upon her. But William Ash threw himself into conversation with Lady Edith Manley, and was presently, to all appearance, happily plunged in gossip, his tall person wholly at ease in a deep armchair, while Lady Eve bent over him with smiles. Meanwhile, there was a certain desertion of Kitty on the part of the ladies. Lady Graceville hardly spoke to her, and the girls markedly avoided her. There was a moment when Kitty, looking round her, suddenly shook her small shoulders, and like a colt escaping from harness, gave herself to riot. She and Cliff amused themselves so well and so noisily that the whole drawing-room was presently uneasily aware of them. Lady Graceville shot glances of wrath, rose suddenly at one moment, and sat down again. Her girls talked more disjointedly than ever to the gentleman who was civilly attending them, while on the other hand Miss Lister's flow of conversation with Louis Harmon was more softly copious than ever. At last the dean's wife looked at the dean, a signal of kind distress, and the dean advanced. Lady Kitty, he said, taking a seat beside the pair, have you forgotten you promised me some French? Kitty turned on him a hot and mutinous face. Did I? What should I say? Some outfit de Mousset? Uh, no, said the dean, I, I think not. Some, some, she cudgelled her memory, some Théophile Gautier? Uh, no, no, certainly not, said the dean hastily. Well, as I don't know a word of him, laughed Kitty. That was mischievous, said the dean, raising a finger. Uh, let me suggest Lamartine. Kitty shook her head obstinately. I never learned one line. Then some of the old fellows, said the dean persuasively. I long to hear you in Corneille or Racine. That we should all enjoy. But suddenly his wrinkled hand fell kindly on the girl's small chilly ringers and patted them. Their eyes met, Kitty's wild and challenging, the Dean's full of that ethereal benevolence which blended so agreeably with his character as courtier and man of the world. There was a bright sweetness in them which seemed to say, Poor child, I understand, but be a little good as well as clever, and all will be well. Suddenly Kitty's look wavered and fell. All the harshness dissolved from her thin young beauty. She turned from Cliff, and the dean saw her quiver with submission. I think I could say some polyust, she said gently. The dean clapped his hands and rose. Uh, Lady Grosville, he said, raising his voice, ladies and gentlemen, Lady Kitty has promised to say us some more French poetry. You remember her admirably she recited last night, but this is Sunday and she will give us something in a different vein. Lady Grosville had risen impatiently sat down again. 
there was a general movement. Chairs were turned or drawn forward till a circle formed. Meanwhile, the dean consulted with Kitty and resumed. Lady Kitty will recite a scene from Corneille's beautiful tragedy of Polyeucte, a scene in which Pauline, after witnessing the martyrdom of her husband, who has been beheaded for refusing to sacrifice to the gods, returns from the place of execution so melted by the love and sacrifice she has beheld that she opens her heart then and there to the same august faith and pleads for the same death. The dean seated himself, and Kitty stepped into the centre of the circle. She thought a moment, her lips moving as though she recalled the lines. Then she looked down at her bare arms and dress, frowned, and suddenly approached Lady Edith Manley. "'May I have that?' she said, pointing to a lace cloak that lay on Lady Edith's knee. "'I'm rather cold.' Lady Edith handed it to her, and she threw it round her. "'Actress,' said Cliff under his breath with a grin of amusement. At any rate, her impulse served her well. Her form and dress disappeared under a cloud of white. She became in a flash, so to speak, evangelised, a most innocent and spiritual apparition. Her beautiful head, her kindled and transfigured face, her little hand on the white folds, these alone remained to mingle their impression with the austere and moving tragedy which her lips recited. Her audience looked on at first with the embarrassed or hostile air which is the Englishman's natural protection against the great things of art. Then, for those who understood French, the high passion and the noble verse began to tell, while those who could not follow were gradually enthralled by the gestures and tones with which the slight, vibrating creature, whom but ten minutes before most of them had regarded as a mere noisy flirt, suggested and conveyed the finest and most compelling shades of love, faith, and sacrificed. When she ceased, there was a moment's profound silence. Then Lady Edith, drawing a long breath, expressed the welcome commonplace which restored the atmosphere of daily life. How could you remember it all? Kitty sat down, her lip trembling scornfully. I had to say it every week at the convent. I understand, said Cliff in Darrell's ear, that last night she was on your soul. An accommodating young woman. Meanwhile, Kitty looked up to find Ash beside her. He said, Magnificent. But it did not matter to her what he said. His face told her that she moved him, and that he was incapable of any foolish chatter about it. A smile of extraordinary sweetness sprang into her, her eyes, and when Lady Graceful came up to her to thank her, the girl impetuously rose and, in the foreign way, kissed her hand, curtsying. Lord Graceful said heartily, "'Pon my word, Kitty, you ought to go on the stage!' And she smiled upon him too, in a flutter of feeling, forgetting his scolding and her own impertinence before dinner. The revulsion, indeed, throughout the company, with two exceptions, was complete. For the rest of the evening, Kitty basked in sunshine and flattery. She met it with a joyous gentleness, and the little figure, still bedraped in white, became the centre of the room's kindness. The dean was triumphant. My dear Miss Lister, he said presently, finding himself near that lady, did you ever hear anything better done? A most remarkable talent. Mary smiled. I am wondering, she said, what they teach you in French convents, and why. It is all so singular, isn't it? Late that night, Ash entered his room, before his usual time, however. He had tired even of Lord Graceville's chat and had left the smoking room still talking. Indeed, he wished to be alone, and there was that in his veins which told him that a new motive had taken possession of his life. He sat beside the open window reviewing the scenes and feelings of the day. His interview with Kitty in the morning, the teasing coquette of the afternoon, the inspired poetic child of the evening. Rapidly, but nonetheless strongly and steadfastly, he made up his mind. He would ask Kitty Bristol to marry him, and he would ask her immediately. Why? He scarcely knew her. 
his mother, his family, would think it madness. No doubt it was madness. Yet as far as he could explain his impulse himself, it depended on certain fundamental facts in his own nature. It was in keeping with his deepest character. He had an inbred love of the difficult, the unconventional in life, of all that piqued and stimulated his own superabundant consciousness of resource and power. And he had a tenderness of feeling, a gift of chivalrous pity, only known to the few, which was in truth always hungrily on the watch, like some starved faculty that cannot find its outlet. The thought of this beautiful child in the hands of such a mother as Madame Destre, and rushing upon risks illustrated by the half-mocking attentions of Geoffrey Cliff, did in truth wring his heart. With a strange imaginative clearness he foresaw her future. He beheld her the prey at once of some bad fellow and of her own temperament. She would come to grief. He saw the prescience of it in her already. What a waste would be there. No, he would step in, capture her before these ways and whims, now merely bizarre or foolish, stiffened into what might in truth destroy her. His pulse quickened as he thought of the development of this beauty, the ripening of this intelligence. Never yet had he seen a girl whom he much wished to marry. He was easily repelled by stupidity, still more by mere amiability. Some touch of acid, of roughness in the fruit, that drew him in politics, thought, love. And if she married him, he vowed to himself, proudly, that she would find him no tyrant. Many a man might marry her who would then fight her and try to break her. All that was most fastidious and characteristic in Ash revolted from such a notion. With him, she should have freedom, whatever it might cost. He asked himself deliberately whether after marriage he could see her flirting with other men as she flirted that day with Cliff and still refrain from coercing her. And his question was answered, or rather put aside, first by the confidence of nascent love. He would love her so well and so loyally that she would naturally turn to him for counsel. And then by the clear perception that she was a creature of mind rather than sense, governed mainly by the caprices and curiosities of the intelligence, combined with a rather cold, indifferent temperament. One moment throwing herself wildly into a dangerous or exciting intimacy, the next parting with a laugh, and without a regret. It was thus he saw her in the future, even as a wife. She may scandalise half the world, he said to himself stubbornly. I shall understand her. But his mother, his friends, his colleagues? He knew well his mother's ambitions for him, and the place that he held in her heart. Could he, without cruelty, impose upon her such a daughter as Kitty Bristol? Well, his mother had a very large experience of life and much natural independence of mind. He trusted her to see the promise in this untamed and gifted creature. He counted on the sense of power that Lady Tramwell possessed and which would but find a new scope in the taming of Kitty. But Kitty's mother? Kitty must, of course, be rescued from Madame Destre, must find a new and truer mother in Lady Tramwell. But money would do it and money must be lavished. Then, almost for the first time, Ash felt a conscious delight in wealth and birth. Panache? He could give it to her, the little wild, lovely thing, luxury, society, adoration, all should be hers. She should be so loved and cherished she must needs love in return. His dreams were delicious and the sudden fear into which he fell at the end, lest, after all, Kitty should mock and turn from him, was only, in truth, another pleasure. No delay. Circumstances might develop at any moment and sweep her from him. Now or never must he snatch her from difficulty and disgrace, let hostile tongues wag as they pleased, and make her his. His political future? He knew well the influence which, in these days of universal publicity, a man's private affairs may have on his public career. And in truth his heart was in that career, and the thought of endangering it hurt him. Certainly it would recommend him to nobody that he should marry Madame Destre's daughter. 
On the other hand, what favour did he want of anybody, save what work and knowing more than the other fellows might compel? The cynic in him was well aware that he had already what other men fought for, family, money and position. Sir Sadie must accept his wife, and Kitty, once mellowed by happiness and praise, might live, laugh and rattle as she pleased. As to strangeness and caprice, the modern world delights in them, the violence take it by force. There is indeed a dividing line, but it was a love marriage that should keep Kitty on the safe side of it. He stood lost in a very ecstasy of resolve, when suddenly there was a sharp movement outside and a flash of white among the yew hedges bordering the formal garden on which his windows looked. The night outside was still unveiled, but of the flash of white he was certain, and of a step on the gravel. Something fell beside him, thrown from outside. He picked it up and found a flower weighted by a stone tied into a fold of ribbon. Madcap, he said to himself, his heart beating to suffocation. Then he stole out of his room and down a small winding staircase which led directly to the garden and a door beside the orangery. He had to unbolt the door, and as he did so, a dog in one of the basement rooms began to bark. But there could be no flinching, though the whole thing was of an imprudence which pricked his conscience. To slip along the shadowed side of the orangery, to cross the space of clouded light beyond, and gain the darkness of the Ilex Avenue beyond, was soon done. Then he heard a soft laugh, and a little figure fled before him. He followed, and overtook. Kitty Bristol turned upon him. "'Didn't I throw straight?' she said triumphantly. "'And they say girls can't throw.' "'But why did you throw at all?' he said, capturing her hand. "'Because I wanted to talk to you, and I was restless and couldn't sleep. "'Why did you never come and talk to me this afternoon? "'And why?' She beat her foot angrily. Did you let me go and play billiards alone with Mr. Cliff? Let you, cried Ash, as if anybody could have prevented you. One sees, of course, that you detest Mr. Cliff, said the whiteness beside him. I didn't come here to talk about Geoffrey Cliff. I won't talk about him. Though, of course, you must know that I flirted with him abominably all the afternoon. C'est vrai, c'est absolument vrai. And I shall always want to flirt with him wherever I am and whatever I may be doing. Do as you please, said Ash dryly, but I think you will get tired. No, no, he excites me. He's bad, false, selfish, but he excites me. He talks to very few women, one can see that, and all the women want to talk to him. He used to admire Miss Lister, and now he dislikes her. But she doesn't dislike him. No, she would marry him tomorrow if he asked her. You are very positive, said Ash. Allow me to say that I entirely disagree with you. You don't know anything about her, said the teasing voice. She is my cousin, mademoiselle. What does that matter? I know much more than you do, though I have only seen her two days. I know that, well, I am afraid of her. Afraid of her? Did you come out, may I ask, determined to talk nonsense? I came out, never mind, I am afraid of her. She hates me. I think, he felt a shiver in the air, it will do me harm if she can. No one shall do you harm, said Ash, his tone changing, if you will only trust yourself. She laughed merrily. Do you? Oh, you'd soon throw it up. Try me, he said, approaching her. Lady Kitty, I have something to say to you. Suddenly she shrank away from him. He could not see her face and had nothing to guide him. I haven't yet known you three weeks, he said, overmastered by something passionate and profound. I don't know what you will say, whether you can put up with me, but I know my own mind. I, I shall not change. I, I love you. I ask you to marry me. A silence. The night seemed to have grown darker. Then a small hand seized his and two soft lips pressed themselves upon it. He tried to capture her, but she evaded him. You, you really and actually want to marry me? I do, Kitty, with all my heart. 
You remember about my mother? About Alice? I remember everything. We would face it together. And you know what I told you about my bad temper? Some nonsense, wasn't it? But I should be bored by the domestic dove. I want the hawk kitty with its quick wings and its daring bright eyes. She broke from him with a cry. You must listen. I have a wicked, odious, ungovernable temper. I should make you miserable. Not at all, said Ash. I should take it very calmly. I am made that way. And then I, I don't know how to put it, but I have fancies, overpowering fancies, and I must follow them. I, I have one now for Geoffrey Cliff. Ash laughed. Ha! Huh, that won't last. Then some other will come after it, and I can't help it. It is my head, she tapped her forehead lightly, that seems on fire. And Ash at last slipped his arm round her. But it is your heart you will give me. She pushed him away from her and held him at arm's length. You are very rich, aren't you? she said in a muffled voice. I am well off. I can give you all the pretty things you want. And some day you will be Lord Tramwell? Yes, when my poor father dies, he said, sighing. He felt her fingers caress his hand again. It was a spirit touch, light and tender. And everyone says you are so clever, you have such prospects. Perhaps you will be Prime Minister. Well, <laughs> there's no saying, he threw out laughing. If you'll come and help. He heard a sob. Help? I should be the ruin of you. I should spoil everything. You don't know the mischief I can do. And I can't help it. It's in my blood. You would like the game of politics too much to spoil it, Kitty? His voice broke and lingered on the name. You would want to be a great lady and lead the party. Should I? Could you ever teach me how to behave? You would learn by nature. Do you know, Kitty, how clever you are? Yes, she sighed, I am clever, but there is always something that hinders and brings failure. How old are you? he said, laughing. Eighteen or eighty? Suddenly he put out his arms, enfolding her, and she, still sobbing, raised her hands, clasped them round his neck, and clung to him like a child. Oh, I knew, I knew when I first saw your face. I have been so miserable all day, and then you looked at me, and I wanted to tell you all. Oh, I adore you. I adore you. Their faces met. Ash tasted a moment of rapture, and knew himself free at last of the great company of poets and of lovers. They slipped back to the house, and Ash saw her disappear by a door on the farthest side of the orangery, noiselessly, without a sound, except that just at the last she drew him to her and breathed a sacred whisper in his ear. Oh, what will, what will Lady Tramore say? Then she fled, but she left her question behind her, and when the dawn came, Ash found that he had spent half the night in trying anew to frame some sort of an answer to it. End of part one, chapter six.